Hi, greetings to everyone and the third part of my reading on the Faustian temptation. Last time I mentioned uh, where I made a confession or to use an old expression, uh, a craving of indulgence, which I repeat this time and we've just talked about, uh, I greatly underestimated the length of work involved and preparing and presenting this theme. It offers such vistas that I realize that I have material sufficient for a course of study or even for a book. My three talks are both too messy and too subjective, I suspect, with too many openings and suggestions and allusions to be described as an argument or thesis, properly speaking. I have hardly found the space to deal this time with the threat to our existence, which I mentioned before in succumbing to temptation. Perhaps my review of the Faustian temptation may be taken as an incentive to discovery, a heightening of awareness, or perhaps the most of perhaps the most prevailing legend within Western culture. Do we or do we not sacrifice our immortal soul in order to achieve success? In the second part of my talk on the Faustian temptation. I noted that Goethe's Faust concluded with a portrayal of Faust's redemption. Insofar as Faust stands for every man, it is mankind which is redeemed at the end of Goethe's Faust. Goethe's vision may be seen as an opening to redemption in the non-denominational manner expressed by Johann Kaspar Lavater, a theologian who admired Goethe and who was influenced and who influenced him. Lavata was the founder of the science of, of physiognomy. His argument is that our face is a signal to which, in, to which the implication comes that perhaps we cannot help being what we are. That sounds like a biological version of Calvin's doctrine of predestination. Darwin was soon to follow. Lavata, with, sorry, Darwin was soon to follow Lavata with the notion that characteristics arrive through a process over generations of selection through trial and error. Christian theology stamps the devil as irredeemable. Goethe's view of a Mephistopheles who can be included in a universal redemption is theologically unorthodox. The puzzling and paradoxical statement by Mephistopheles early in Goethe's tragedy is incompatible with the religious, by no means uniquely Christian, belief in a force of evil extraneous to God and independent of God, for Goethe's devil serves God's plan in despite of himself. Ich bin, Goethe's Mephistopheles tells the doctor, ich bin ein Teil von jener Kraft, der stets das Böse will and stets das Gute schafft. I am a part of that power which always seeks harm and always creates what is good. This paradoxical and baffling theodicy is incomprehensible within orthodox Christian eschatology. Um, eschatology being the destiny, mm. destiny of the soul. And uh, I think this is a very important part of understanding Goethe, mm. that it is thoroughly unorthodox in a, in a standard Christian orthodox context. We might crudely summarize this view as, don't worry, it all works out in the end. The question which is posed in the Faust legend is not simply what is evil? Why is evil permitted? But even what is the point of evil? What is evil good for? And that's a paradoxical question if there ever was one. Opinions vary as to the extent that Goethe was Christian, but there is no doubt that he presents a redemptive conclusion to his Faust. Whether we understand that conclusion as religious in the strict sense of the word or not, not only is Faust the sinner saved, his tempter Mephistopheles is saved as well. Mephistopheles is converted, if that is the right word, to a genuine earthly felicity by means of beneficent, or at least not maleficent, enchantment. Faust too concludes with a transformed, beautified and saintly Margaret interceding for the sinner. Faust is saved and ascends into heaven, whilst Mephistopheles succumbs to the blandishments of lightly clad, apparently hermaphroditic angels. If not in a state of grace, he is at the very least no longer planning mischief. The optimistic vision of Faust as a human saga of growing enlightenment and escape from the shadows of superstition 
accords with the doctrine of human progress. Goethe's pantheism can be understood as a poetic expression of the doctrine of the brotherhood of man. The optimism expressed in Goethe's Faust can assume hyperbolic forms. I wonder if anyone here can guess who wrote the following. Goethe let Faust as an old man finally recognize that only the creative and communal work of a liberated people can bring the highest felicity. What the creation of a freed people on a freed land will precisely be, Goethe left open. You could say that a Faust part three is missing, yet such a work was not for Goethe to write because the time was not ripe for such a work. In the developing capitalist order, an order of exploitation, oppression and wars, the third part of Faust could not yet have been written. Now, just 120 years after Goethe put his quill down for the last time, have the workers and peasants, the white and blue collar workers, the scientists and technicians, all the laboring people of the German Democratic Republic begun to write Faust part three through their own labor and through their struggle for freedom and for socialism. That was Walter Ulbricht, newly appointed head of the East German state, writing in the communist paper Neues Deutschland on the 28th of March, 1962. So at the end of the Faust saga, Faust as every man or every working man triumphs and heaven is a place on earth. The tempter then must be some reactionary, some primitive, some anti-progressive force, some atavistic aftermath. That reactionary force is overcome by the inexorable demands of time and the progress of the human spirit towards the universalist and universal light of knowledge and humanism. It is so rational that even Mephistopheles must acknowledge the change which progress brings and the inexorable force of dialectical logic. That is one facet of our legend. That is the enlightened view, the view that we are progressing ever upwards into an enchanted land. Welcome Faust, welcome devil, all is forgiven. Another interpretation was expressed by among others, the German nationalist, firm believing Christian and founder of the so-called German church, Arta Dinter. Dinter believed that Goethe was always deeply Christian and his Mephistopheles diabolic in the most traditional sense, one who comes from somewhere else, an alien to spoil and demean the pure intention of the highest race of man who assisted by God is ever aspiring to betterment. There is Arthur Drews who in 1910 made his famous speech at Die, Christ, uh, Die Christen Mutter in, the, in which he argued that Jesus Christ himself was more a symbol than a man and had in fact historically not existed. For the Canadian philosopher Charles, and that's an important point because Jesus Christ is singularly missing from both the legends of Faust and the legends of Don Juan. For the mm -hmm. Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor, the Faustian pact consists in abandoning responsibility to that which is beyond us by concentrating on a blind individualism. The pursuit of self-satisfaction is the allurement by which Mephistopheles tempts all of us not to care or not to care enough as we hurtle towards an abyss of man-made or devil-made self-destruction. Yet another interpretation is that Mephistopheles is within us. Faust and Mephistopheles akin to Mr. Jekyll and Dr. Hyde. So it is that the Faust legend can be interpreted in diverse and incompatible ways, but it can never be ignored. Goethe was no stranger to romanticism, but he did not commit himself to any romantic vision, whether politically, as witness his coldness towards the French Revolution, or poetically, as in Faust. The romantic Leiden des Jungen Werthers is a romantic work, but ends with the disaster which is associated with the, face, with the fate of Faustus in Marlowe, and not Faust in Goethe's tragedy. We've, we've Trust, contrasted with his own life experience, it is as though Goethe intended Werther to be a work of caution, recounting what his fate could have been if he had not become ruthless and reasonable. Similarly, in Faust, Goethe seems to be projecting into Faust his weaker self. From the point of view of resistance to temptation, Goethe seems to have withstood the trials of his life successfully and led a successful career in every possible respect. 
The overriding message to Faust and to every man is, see where you are going, see where you are going. Don't listen to the serpent who whispers lies. Succumbing to temptation brings about your ruin. Implicitly too is the optimistic mes message. Look at me. I am successful and powerful and happy, and I signed no contract with the adversary. I did not compromise myself. Is Goethe's Faust a warning against romanticism? After all, are, we not the, are not the excesses and illusions of Faust and the promptings of Mephistopheles a kind of romanticism or a caricature of romanticism? One which sits about a man who sits aloof above the masses, who disdains them, who cultivates the overriding importance and superiority of his own soul and yearns to enhance his individual experience and enjoyment of life and extend his power. Is romantic conceit and a partner's a temptation of the other? There is another Faust, published four years after Goethe's Faust, part two, in whose account of the temptation, Faust remains inextricably immersed in a pessimistic romantic gloom. That gloom has a name in German, Weltschmerz, world weariness in English, manifested in that distancing, that alienation, that Nordic brooding of which the first immortal and greatest exemplar in literature is Hamlet. This Faust, like Goethe's Faust, is formally a drama, but its monumental monologues and declamations, long periods of near total inaction, and its episodic structure give the lie to that description. It is an epic poem and nothing for the theater. Dialogues are supported by lengthy, lengthy descriptive commentaries which play the role of a Greek chorus. I am referring to Nikolaus Lenau's Faust. Nikolaus Lenau, to give him his full name, Nikolaus Franz Nimvich Edler Zustre Lenau, was born in Satad, I hope I pronounced that correctly, today in Romania, and called, I find this a bit cheesy, Lenauheim, after the poet. <laughs> after three years incomplete study of philosophy in Vienna, Lenau went on to study law in Pressburg, now Bratislava. Uh, broke off his studies, then studied agriculture, took up the study, study of law for a second time, again without finishing his studies, and finally became a student of medicine. This restlessness sounds very Faust-like. When his mother and grandmother died in 1829, Lenau inherited enough not to have to work for a living although he apparently gambled away a large part of his inheritance a short time afterwards. In 1832, Lenau traveled to Baltimore in the Young Republic of the United States of America, where he bought about 500 acres of land. His plans, if that is what they were, to become a farmer in the new world were unsuccessful. He seemed to have found little pleasure in farming and was disappointed with what he saw of the Young Republic. In 1833, he returned to Europe where he met and fell in love with one Sophie von Löwenthal, the wife of a high-ranking civil servant in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This love, unrequited, seems to have been as desperate, passionate, extreme and romantic as any love in Goethe's life, with a significant difference that Lenin was not able to take a grip on himself, not able to abandon his love, to become reasonable, to master his passion or resign himself to the hopelessness of it. Leno wrote his, wrote his Faust in 1836. In 1844, he commenced work on a never to be finished Don Juan. In the same year, he suffered a stroke and was taken to a mental asylum in Schloss Winnetal, and from 1847 was nursed in a private institution for the insane near Vienna until his death in 1855. Leno's fate recalls, does it not, Nietzsche's. Are these wandering extreme lost souls not romantic, not sick, not Faustian? Like Goethe, Lenau was sensitive to the competing impulse of romantic and erotic love, a subject examined by Kierkegaard and a recurring theme in the writings of Thomas Mann, the focus, for example, of Mann's early short story, Gefallen, a word in German which means both fallen and pleasure. The striking similarities and equally striking differences between Lenau and Goethe's lives are mirrored in the similarities and differences of their portrayal of the Faust legend. Both were born into privileged circumstances in Central Europe in the German-speaking world. 
Both writers fell in love. Both writers, as young men, were restless spirits. Both achieved considerable fame from their writing during their lifetime. But Goethe's personal, material, and social life was successful. Lerno's life reads like a rake's progress, or even the decline of one who has made the unspeakable contract. Goethe mastered his love, was ruthless with himself and with others. Goethe channeled and, and disciplined his restlessness into his examination and inquiring studies of art, architecture, zoology, chemistry, and plants. Goethe's Faust is saved from the consequences of his mistakes, but Leno's Faust is doomed from the beginning. Leno's Faust presents the reader with a dark, unpleasant, even nihilistic vision, far from the pantheism of the reasonable, humanistic, at times humorous Faust of Goethe. The period in which Leno wrote, wrote between the end of the Napole Napoleonic Empire in 1814 and the revolutions of 1848 is sometimes called the Biedermeier, characteristic by a, characterized by a conservative and inward looking depiction of social reality. Nature in the Biedermeier world is friendly, refreshing and consoling. Heinrich Clauron's Mimili is said to exemplify the genre. Rousseau's love of nature without Rousseau's politics. The description would not well apply to Lena, whose writing is nearly invariably pessimistic and quite indisputably romantic. Here is a short and simple poem by Lenau, which exemplifies the melancholy which pervades his opus. It shows the dark side of romanticism, which those familiar with English literature will recognize from Jean, uh, John Keats's Belle Dame Sans Merci. So uh, if you've got, got that um, to hand, should be the Lenau poem. That's very nice. So we've got a German uh, uh, native speaker here. I think that, uh, Daniel, um, and I don't know if anybody else. Uh, Daniel, would you be able to, uh, would you like to, should I say, read the short <laughs> poem to the spring there, Lenz? Oh, is, is Daniel there? Hmm. Oh, have we got any other German native speaker? I think Daniel is. is can, you, can you hear me? Can You're a bit far away, now? but that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> die Bäume blühen. Die Vöglein singen, die Wiesen bringen ihr erstes Grün. Hier tut mir leid, zu treten die Erden und hier zu gefährden ihr neues Fleisch. Sie hat nicht acht, ob Knospen springen und Grün singen mich traurig macht. The English uh, translation yep. too. Yeah, no, I think so perhaps would somebody, any volunteer for the English translation, English native speaker? Uh, may, maybe one of the ladies present. Because sure, absolutely, because the, um... there aren't, yeah, yeah. Well, um, English is really my second language, but I can give it a try. Yeah, yeah, uh, good greetings, uh, Krista, good nice good to have you. Thank yeah, you. hello. Uh, the trees blossom, the small bird sings, the meadows bring their first green. It nigh wounds me to tread the earth and imperil her in new dress. She takes no care with the bursting buds and spring songs make me sad. So there we are. It's, um, thank you very much. Um, you see, this is the already, that, that is one of his less dark poems, by the way. Um, it's, nearly everything he writes is um, shot through with a sort of melancholy and gloom. So uh, the romantic may rejoice to behold the spring or the romantic may feel the sharp contrast between the joys of spring and the darkness born of his own frustrations, his singularity. Leno's Faust, we learn from the narrator's commentary, is something of a zoologist and botanist, but a frantic, random, callous and wasteful one. In contrast to Mimili's caring and careful naming of plants in Cloran's novel, Lenaus Faust discards what he catches almost immediately, a Don Juan of zoology, <laughs> perhaps. Make a short quotation here. Viel Pflanzen hat er schon entflucht dem Grund und kaum besehen geworfen in den Schlund. Viel Stein schon hat dringend aufgerafft, am Fels erschmettert seine Leidenschaft und manchen Sekt zerknickt des Forsches Hand. 
He has plucked many small plants from the ground, then hardly looked at them, thrown them down into the abyss. Many a stone has he hurriedly collected. His passion shatters on the cliff, and many an insect snaps in the explorer's hands. This is a Faust whose thirst for knowledge and engagement with nature is marked by death and waste. Very characteristic of the scientific, especially zoological impulse of the 19th century naturalist was to collect and collecting, whether specimens or trophies, meant killing. Generations of Victorian schoolboys collected birds' eggs and butterflies. The butterflies would be killed in so-called killing bottles using crushed laurel leaves and later replaced by ethyl acetate. The insects, the dead insects, hopefully dead insects, were then pinned in cabinets with their Latin names neatly inscribed below them. Accounts of rare birds visiting the British Isles in the 19th century are usually accompanied by an account of where and when sighted and who did it and promptly shot the rare bird. Lenos Faust is like Byron's Manfred. He seeks solace in the mountains and finds none, unless it be to realize more deeply the amplitude of the solitude of the independent spirit. Whereas By Byron's Manfred is safe from leaping into the abyss by a chamois hunter, Faust is saved from doing so, though doing the very same thing by Mephistopheles, hunter of souls. Lenau's devil is so much a nihilist that he confesses later that it makes little difference if he let Faust live or die. Only that if Faust lives, he might spread more harm in the world, so it's better for Faust not to die quite yet. Man is ruined one way or another. Have we got, uh, there's a picture, I don't know if you've um, got that to hand, it should be a Ford, Maddox Ford's painting of Manfred uh, being saved from suicide. Yeah, there it is, nice dramatic poem. There's mm. a Manfred's about to throw himself into the abyss and the chamois hunter just saves him from doing so. And mm. Lenau, I think inspired by that, had the same scene, but it's, it's Mephistopheles who saves Faust from throwing himself into the abyss, from killing himself. And then Mephistopheles said, well, I only did it because you can do a bit more harm in your life and that would be good for our cause, <laughs> but it really doesn't matter if you live or die. Mm. This is very far from Goethe, I think. Time does not permit, and it really, I mean, Lenau's Faust, I think that Goethe has some long passages. I think Leno um, pips him at the post there. He goes on for pages, some of the speeches. But um, although time does not permit to prov provide an extensive exegesis of Lenau's Faust, which is beautiful in a dreary way. And by the way, I did look for English translations. I can't find any. Um, I don't know if that's because I didn't look in the right place, but uh, I couldn't find any on the internet. Uh, so I have translated myself a few short passages to illustrate the very different tone compared to Goethe's. The opening scene uh, called in Lenau Der Besuch, The Visit, follows the introduction from the chorus and takes place in an anatomical theatre where Goethe and Faust are examining and taking to pieces a corpse. Uh, it, it almost resembles old thing Frankenstein more than it does uh, mm. Goethe's Faust, I think. In contrast to Goethe's Mephistopheles, Mephistopheles in Lenau's Faust needs no conjuring or effort to be summoned and appears immediately after Faust speaks. Um, it's also an important point. You don't have to make an effort in, in Lenau's world to, to, to get the devil to come to you. You, you just have to say, you know, I, I hate God or something, and he'll pop up like a jack in the box. Uh, whereas uh, both Marlowe's Faustus and Goethe's Faust have to put in quite a lot of work. And I think that's significant. When we come to Thomas Mann, uh, it, 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 he's been waiting all the time. Anyway, um, in this case, there's the rejection of the gods. And uh, it's not that, but the gods' rejection of him. So Leno's Faust says, the gods have rejected me, not I have rejected the gods. And it's gods, not God. The divine has rejected me. I have made no moral choice. I am predestined, as it were, to damnation. There seems to be the implied message. And the contract is more a confirmation of what is already known. And this is similar to Thomas Mann. Than a, uh, than a leap into the dark or, or a very conscious and drastic decision as such. Uh, the dotted lines in all the following excerpts stand for parts which I have omitted, um, not wishing to draw out the extracts too long. For both Nicholas Lenau and Thomas Mann, I will not say that they were long-winded, but neither writer was ever at a loss for words. 
and so one has to keep it short to a reasonable extent. So the next one you see extract from the visit, Nicholas Leonard, der Besuch, the visit. So we've got, um, I think, I can't remember actually, it's three parts, is it? Yeah, yeah, three yeah parts, that's right, three Wagner, parts. Maybe there's maybe the uh, Wagner um, is obviously a pretty small part. So um, is, is Father Frank going to be Faust, Michael? Uh, oh, yes, uh, absolutely. Yes, he certainly could be if we're not going to read all day because he, 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 mm. the devil later on. But I, if we're not going to do the whole thing today, mm. um, I, if he feels he would like to do that. But, and and who would be Mephistopheles? His voice is a bit is a bit distant. It's a pity. Mm. Anyone like to do Wagner is is it's a small part, but it's yeah, it's them. Are you asking me to do anything? <clears throat> well, we were yeah. If you'd like to do the to, <laughs> to do the to do the Faust, or oh, I don't know, actually, it might be better if you did the the Mephistopheles. It'd be more logical, wouldn't it? Uh, incidentally, yeah, I apologise yeah. if uh, there is little. Um, uh, buzzing noise uh, which my computer makes. I think it's overheating. I've got to find a way of fixing it, but you will hear some kind of buzzing noise. I'm sorry. Okay, okay, right. Um, well, no, I've, maybe. Uh, I'll read Wagner if you like. Oh, great, excellent. So then we just need a, um, a Faust. Michael, you should select someone, uh, you know. Um... Yeah, well, who have we? Who have you got? I would normally select Michael York, but I, I see your computer's not doing so well, is it? I don't know. If well, we can... well I, I can do it. Oh, okay. It seems to be all right now. Oh. Oh. oh, okay. Well, I think Mike jumped in there, so fine. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Mike from Mick. Mick, uh... Mick. Sorry, yeah, yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> A profusion of Michaels here. Yeah. yeah, that's true, really. Too much. Yeah, so, okay, yeah. Mick, if you want to. Okay, so we we starting now, yes? Yes. You know nothing more of life than the beast does for all your study of anatomy. Asta, you jest. What extreme delight it is to learn from a fresh cadaver. How all the finely wrought wonderful figments fit together. How each organ harmoniously functions, obedient to the whole. It may cheer you, friend, the deep knowledge that this dead man, when he was healthy, stuffed his mouth with food and tore it with his teeth. To your fortune, no invention. The stomach was fitted out to digest. And that in the chosen instance, bile drips out of the liver and that juices flow through the veins. And what else researchers ingeniously disclose? But the whole wisdom is not enough to say the very smallest doubt. Often when I, though, often when I through solitary nights of study, only with the still corpses for my company and in the patchwork of the ingenious nerves, I eagerly pursue the dark paths of life, when to my view is disclosed the trunk of nerves with its buds and branches, then my madness calls enraptured by such discovery. The tree of knowledge I see clear of which the Bible tells in the old dispensation. Here the soul dreamed its childhood dream, slumbering sweetly in the shadow of these branches and wafting through the sweet air of paradise. And birds fly past with blissful songs, enchanting guests from other worlds. But hardly is the soul wakened from its dream and its yearning bursts into flame to pluck the sweet fruit from the branches, irredeemably shatter its peace. I want so I call to enjoy this fruit, even if the gods eternally disown me. Oh, I it's uh, Father Frank. Uh... Can you hear my voice now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you, you just mu muted yourself. Okay. <laughs> Ha ha, master anatomist, very fine and cute. The fatal root of a tree of paradise lost has taken root in your skull and is now in your pineal gland. Mick, are you, are you there or have you been called away? Uh, Who is that? He's still awake and about after the clocks have already sounded midnight. Excuse me for pressing in so late. But I'm a doctor too, and not as successful. I enjoy spending the nights with a wise, considering and interpreting the lot of man. Oh, unhappy words, the lot of man. I feel it in all the bitterness. From the mother's womb to the womb of death, I am driven by relentless, deeply hooded time. Time, the slave to unknown powers. She responds with not a word to all my questions, indifferent to my curses and to my discouragement. She's thrust me further through the nights of life. 
Within me is an army of powers, eerily autonomous, restless, inflamed, flaring up to profound and secret endeavor, which my spirit neither wants nor knows of. So I am excluded from myself, and ever baited by doubts and torn, a stranger with no purpose and no fatherland, dizzy, running astray, and I torment myself between the dark abyss of my soul and the sealed cliff wall of the world on the narrow and steady crossing bridge of consciousness for so long as my heart will care to beat. Yeah, mm. thank, thanks very much for that. And uh, so I nice hearing yeah. that, which sort of, I think, uh, reinforces my belief that then I was somewhat underestimated. It was pretty good, wasn't it? Very good. Uh, I, yeah, really good. As I say, as far as I know, there's now I see no English translation mm. and I, I'm not sure I haven't checked, but I don't think he's available in modern edition in German. Um, my, my edition is a, is a terrible uh, cheap edition from from 1890 with a, a very bad paper and and, and and the print is quite bad the, with the fracture of the shrift yeah. you know, the gothic it all rather sort of stuck together and pages already beginning to fall out and yeah anyway um, in the following scene Faust signs away his soul the scene is called Die Verschreibung which in German is a twofold pun the word means medical prescription, which in a sense Faust is receiving to allay his world weariness. But for Schreibung also means a contract, handing over a bond or a pact. And finally, for Schreibung can also mean something wrongly written. So right. we have the second, which is the signing. And Faust has just been talking about his prayers, by the way. So that's right. Right. For, for Father Frank. Uh... Okay. Um, ha! The prayer is a wind. If you're a man, compose yourself at once, or I shall leave you in contempt. The devil has no business with a child. These pages, once precious to you, Throw them in this fire, and once they're burned thoroughly, strew by the way of penis in your hair, the ashes of, of your beloved book, with a repentance saying, bend your ash strewn head, that, that you were so foolish and believed. Truth ever shy and ever fleeting, the truth which makes your pulse race. Could ever quite tame and obedient have crept between with pigskin covers, beat your forehead often with your fist, that you were so stupid as to hope that you had ever dreamed of the story in long since faded pages of your youth? Might ever stay green through the season of time and could yet bear you fruit? could forever refresh your heart because just one rose once buried. Oh, friend, be sick to death that you were so stupid ever to have loved every species prescribed, the monstrous despot of your ages. Mick, are you, are you there? If I know that he sometimes has to attend to his his, his mother, may, may, maybe um, Michael from London can jump in with Faust. It were not easy not to love the Lord. Did my heart not love truth more? So Faust, a right beginning, truth more. There is much gained by that. Now look how the fire is thrusting out its tongue, leaking ever blessed pages. Throw it in, throw it in, and break the bonds which hold you. No more will I be enticed by faith. It burns. The spell is conquered. The comfort which she brought is scattered in grave flakes of ash. Now close the deal. Almost the best way for that would be for you to hang yourself from this branch. But you will want to tarry a little, this patch of earth. And when I come to think about it, it would be a pity if you strung yourself at once. Half your life has passed away, lost in resentment and brooding, lost in solitary night nice studies. You have done nothing, enjoyed nothing. You have tasted women yet. You have not tasted women yet, <laughs> nor laid out an enemy in his blood. 
conceiving lovingly and killing with hatred, is the north, oops, so this is blocking my um, vision here, is the north and south of man's existence. I swear by my life to give you truth as your wage and fame and honor, power and gold, and everything the senses delight to have. It goes without saying, your soul is in the teal. Let your crusted hand bleed to sign your bond. And so they we each subscribe, here's a cockerel feather. What is it, Faust? You look so pale. Are you taking the fun to heart? Give me the cockerel quill. Here I sign the contract because I no longer wish to doubt. It's my files. Now it's done. Farewell. I'll see you again soon. Much of it. Extremely sinister. Mephistopheles. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the last ax, uh, extract which I've chosen is called Faust's Tod, Faust's Death, which is self-explanatory. Not only is Faust not saved, his death is sordid, pointless, and all the more terrible for that. No chanting or enchanting devils, just his own dark thoughts, his madness, his alienation, his solitude, and his delusion that he will find solace in death. And this is the last quite grim. I hope it doesn't distress people too much. I find it in a way actually quite distressing. Is, is this, this is, Faust? Uh, this is Faust speaking. Yeah. Faust is not my real self. Only a marring of the consciousness of God, a dream of God, a confused dream, the ephemeral laughing, laughing foam of the deep sea. And if a man like Faust engenders a child, one dream is woven into the neck. Approach, evil spirit. I laugh at you and yours, you lie giver. I laugh at our pact. Only appearance concluded with appearance. Are you listening? Now we go our separate ways, too black and fearful to have essence. Am but a dream fluttering out of your bondage. I am a dream with desire and guilt and pain. And I dream this knife into my heart. <laughs> Not you and I being chained one to another is a dream, your flight is that, and our salvation I would sooner horribly discover. You were from reconciliation never so far, as the time you sought with feverish despairing fervor to extinguish all dispute, wanted you the world and God merged to one. So doing, you leapt into my arms. Now I have you and enclose you. Mm. Yes, fine. Thank, thank you very much for that yeah i i wanted more of that that was that was really really good wasn't it really powerful well, there it is well perhaps i'll try to find a publishing house to commission me to yeah. translate it if no one's done it um it's quite fun trying to translate it although a bit a bit grim um it does seem unbe very surprising to me uh, if it is if i'm right and there is no english mm -hmm. version of lenas faust but it, that seems to be the case Mm. So if anybody can correct me or discovers that there is, I, I would be interested to hear that. I mentioned in my second talk that there are clear similarities between the legend of Faust and the legend of Don Juan or Don Juan, or in Italian, Don Giovanni. Don Juan is that legendary libertine with an insatiable, indiscriminate appetite for women who ignores all warnings to change his ways and is eventually damned. The legend originated in Spain, and the first story we know of it is El Convidado de Piedra, The Stone Guest by Tirso de Molina, written in round about 1630. The legend was taken up by Moliere, who sets the scene in Sicily. His play, called Don Juan, opens with Sanyarel praising tobacco. Sanyarel is Don Juan's uh, factotum, a little bit like the Wagner figure for Faust, actually. Quoi que puisse dire Aristote et toute la philosophie n'est rien d'égal au tabac. C'est la passion des honnêtes gens et qui vit sans tabac n'est pas digne de vivre. Oh, this praise of tobacco is the praise of sensuous life. It was very topical at the time and was therefore used because tobacco had just been introduced to Europe and was very topical in both Britain and uh, controversial as well in both Britain and in France. 
Um, and I take that, that opening line as almost a, a symbolic of the indulgence in pleasure, which is part of the Don Juan legend and the Faust legend too. The legend is probably best known, however, as recounted in Mozart's adaptation for opera, Don Giovanni. Early in the opera, Don Giovanni is challenged by the father of Donna Anna. Donna Anna is being ravished by Don Giovanni. I use the word carefully. To what extent his ravishment is actually a rape is, I think, open to interpretation. Be that as it may, Don Giovanni kills the father with suspicious ease, just as Faust easily and swiftly kills Valentine, Margaret's brother in Goethe's Faust. A statue to the murdered father is erected and Don Giovanni invites the statue mockingly to dinner, just as Molina's Don Gonzalo, as a statue was invited, uh, invited the statue and Molière's Don Juan invites the devil and they invite their fate. For Molière's Don Juan, I'm oh, sorry, yes, they invite their fate and miraculously the statue it does come to the dinner, recalling the title of the original story, El Convidado de Piedra. The appearance of the statue understandably terrifies Leporello, that's Mozart's equivalent of Sagnarelle, and Don Giovanni refuses to repent, giving the statue his hand with the word Ecola, and he is drawn into hell. And so the uh, signing of the contract, if it can be called that, comes at the end in the Don Juan legend instead of at the beginning. The most striking similarity in the legends of Faust and Don Juan is the open-eyed defiance of the threat of perdition. As I mentioned, Lenau began a Don Juan too, but he himself fell into madness well mm. before he could complete it. His life seeming to, fate, to mirror the fate of Don Juan or Faust, or for that matter, of Nietzsche. Don Juan, or the Dom Juan for Molière and Faust, can be interpreted as heroic, even courageous figures who live for the moment, who seek to ignore time in the case of Dom Juan, or reverse or halt time in the case of Faust. Alternatively, they can be seen as licentious, immoral, and privileged aristocrats, seducers who deserve their fate. They are both prepared to, bar they are both prepared to barter or discard salvation, in order to heighten their knowledge and joy of the present and a heightened awareness of the present and what it can bring to them. They are hazarding their soul, Faust in respect of the Christian God, Don Juan in respect, not directly of a Christian God, I think, but of a Christian ordained justice as embodied, or should I say as petrified in the Convidado de Piedra, the stone guest. Convidado, by the way, means literally the invited one. A translation of Convidado de Piedra into English as the invited one would be ungainly, but it is worth recalling that it has this resonance in Spanish and that Don, Don Gonzalo, Don Giovanni, invi invites the man he has killed and whose daughter he has ravished to dinner. He invites his fate. The man of stone is invited to the feast of life because Don Juan wills to call a halt to time. But our lived life with all the shocks and blows, or put it in a Christian lexis, all its sins will find us out. Time moves on. Don Juan invites the guests to come, recalling Macbeth's words to Banquo, fail not our feast. Maybe perdition will discover us in the midst of our triumphal complacency at a banquet. The temptations of the libertine and the ambitious professor are temptations to defy nature and specifically to defy the element in nature which we recognized as most inexorably belonging to nature, and that's time. In that sense, Faust and Don Juan, as I see them, can be understood as two aspects of the same archetype. They are the time defiers. Mm. I wasted time and now does time waste me, declares Shakespeare's Richard II. The time is out of joint, O oh, cursed spite, that ever I was born to put it right, declares Hamlet. All religions, without exception, are interpretations and accounts of time and a way of rendering time and thus the mutability of the natural world comprehensible. Religion gives sense to chronology. At a simple level for the individual, the question is, what happens to what is uniquely me before the cradle and after the grave? What is the very meaning of oblivion and non-oblivion? 
There is a significant difference, I think, between the two legends. For in the mm -hmm. Faust legend, we are aware of an outside force. There may not be a deus ex machina as such, but there are outside beings, maybe two, God and devil, maybe only one, the tempter, Mephistopheles. Whether we believe him to be within Faust or a power beyond and without Faust, he enters into dialogue with him, he tempts him. There's no such dialogue or contract in the legend, which I call Faustian, of the convidado de piedra. At least I may qualify that. There is a kind of contract, if it can be called that, right at the end. Don Juan is born into original sin, if one will, the sin of succumbing to the temptation of the real world and defying retribution beyond it. His choice is to repent by abandoning, one might say, selling his pride. That's the option. And his price would be redemption. Faust is tempted at the beginning in one direction. Don Juan is tempted at the end in the other direction, by which I mean Faust is tempted to make a deal with the devil. And Don Juan is tempted at the end to leave his life and return to security, society, morality. The German writer Dietrich Graber wrote a composition called Don Juan und Faust, so the two together, in which he contrasts the two figures, or for some, two heroes, as both doomed by their egotism, but he distinguishes between them. Don Juan being merely material and sensual in his aspirations, Faust having higher ambitions of spiritual superiority and knowledge. Two kinds of disobedience, but the same challenge and the same dilemma. Do we accept the kind of existence and the social mores into which we are born, or do we set about to break the confines of our bonds and challenge, even blaspheme, against the strictures, social order, and sanctioned cosmos of our time? The two legends are fueled by a way of understanding the world which only found widespread expression at the end of the 18th century, which, which had taken root long before. Don Juan and Faust express a romantic yearning for freedom. The romantic is associated with a return to origins, a quest for purity, a seeking for the source, individual heroism, respect for nature, idealism, and chivalry. The romantic movement of the late 18th and early 19th century was inspired by the idealism of the Middle Ages. The individualism of the romantic poet of the 19th century, the traditional starving poet in his garret, was that of the knight errant and minstrel poet in one. The romantic is preoccupied with the remorselessness of time. Nature, to which the romantic is necessarily drawn, shows in the northern hemisphere how time flows not in a line, as in the Christian story of progress tells us, but in a ring, in a rhythm of seasons. Romance and romanticism has its lexical origin in story, tale. It is a tale of youth, for it is enthusiasm and wonder which marks the romantic mind and the desire for solitude. Let me die a young man's death, not a clean and in between the sheets. What a nice way to go, death. The notion of passively complying with the slowing down of the faculties, the loss of energy and passion associated with age is not romantic. And I would say in passing that the religious obsession of modern societies with cheating death and drawing out the lives of the old as far as possible is very unromantic. A long old age is not much of a story. Romantic writers were likely to die young. Their mm. romantic enthusiasm seemed like a part of their very sickness. Keats died of tuberculosis at the age of 25 in Rome. Byron, who wrote his own Don Juan, died of a fever at the age of 35 in Greece, where he was seeking to assist the cause of national independence. Pushkin, who also wrote a Don Juan, by the way, died of peritonitis at 36. Novalis died of tuberculosis at the age of 28. Sandor Paterfi, the romantic poet of Hungary, perished from causes unknown at the age of 25. The very notion of dying young, heroically and sadly, is inherently romantic. Perhaps, uh, instead, you have that painting by Thomas Watts, which I think we can see in the Tate Gallery. Henry Wallace, actually. Wallace, sorry. Wallace, not Watts. Yeah, and I actually wrote Watts. Thanks. So, is it in the Tate Gallery, I think? Yeah, it was uh, when I last went there, which was about 20 years ago. <laughs> I hope it's still there. Oh, Chatterton, this painting, Death of Chatterton. Oh, Chatterton, how very sad thy fate, dear child of sorrow, son of misery, how soon the film of death obscured that eye, whence genius wildly flashed and high debate, 
how soon that voice majestic and elate melted in dying numbers oh how nigh was night to thy fair morning that was the, yeah that was the words of tribute by john keats in honor of thomas chatterton who took his own life in 1770 at the age i believe of 17. Romantic is how I would describe both the legend of Faust and of Don Juan. It is therefore imperative that saved or damned, the heroes must die. A striking feature of the legend of the stone jet guest from the original legend of El Convidado de Piedra is that in no version of which I am aware does the libertine escape the terrible punishment of damnation. As a character, Don Juan is as much an enigma as Faust and for similar reasons. Is his rebellion a sinful transgression of the divine order or a cry of liberty? The Spanish literary critic Madariaga, author of The Magnificent, which I, I really can recommend it, although it's of course a very personalized view, author of The Magnificent and well-known study of Hamlet, noted that Molio made, Melia made of Don Juan the first Voltairian and a forerunner of the encyclopedists. Bertolt Brecht summarily dismissed Molière's Don Juan with the comment, Wir sind gegen parasitäre Lebensfreude. We are opposed to parasitical hedonism. So do we admire the, his zest for freedom and defiance of morality and convention? It is not only the question, are you on the side of God and the angels or the adversary and his cohorts, but also the question, who is who? In this terrible struggle, which may be the struggle of one and his doppelganger, we may even not be able to tell them in the heat of the struggle. Faust perishes in private. Don Juan perishes in public. There is no bargain and dilemma in Don Juan. He is what he is. The temptation is very different. It is a temptation at the end of his life to recant, a temptation which the libertine stoutly resists. Marlos Faustus read the words from Romans 623, Summum peccati mors est, the wages of sin is death. It was probably the doctor, Don, the joker Don Juan, who first mockingly added, as some people will have observed from lavatory walls, the comment, but the hours are good. An underlying tension characterizes both legends. I mean that between individualism, humor, courage, and vivacity on the one hand, and morality, decency, justice, and altruism on the other. In evident accord with Graber's view, Søren Kierkegaard wrote in Enten Ela, that's either or, Don Juan is the expression of the demonic as the sensuous, Faust the expression of the demonic in the form of the intellectual or spiritual, which the Christian spirit excludes. Faust is idea, but an idea which is essentially individual. Don Juan constantly hovers between being an idea and being an individual. Never before in the world has sensuousness been conceived as it is in Don Juan as a principle. For this reason, the erotic is defined by another predicate. The erotic in Don Juan is seduction. And strangely enough, the idea of a seducer was entirely wanting among the Greeks. This calls to mind the division which Oswald Spengler made in Untergang des Abendlands, Decline of the West, contrasting the space-confining art of Greek or Apollonian culture with the soaring into space of Faustian culture. Elsewhere, Kierkegaard writes, Christianity is spirit and spirit is the positive principle it has brought into the world. But when sensuality is viewed under the qualification of spirit, its significance is seen to be that it is to be excluded but precisely because it is to be excluded, it is defined as a principle, as a power. For that which spirit, itself principle, is supposed to exclude must be something which manifests itself as a principle, even it is, if it only shows itself in that way when it is excluded. It's an extremely complicated text, but which I understand to mean that by excluding something, you make it manifest, you give it an, uh, an individual existence, and in this case, of course, the dynamic. dynamic. The sensuality referred to is, in Kierkegaard's view, of all the arts most forcibly expressed in music. And Kierkegaard understands music as the expression of demonic sensuality. Spirit and sensuality may be, and in Christian culture were, posited as opposing elements. 
sensuality posing as spirituality, that is to say, being made into a principle, a way of life, was seen by Kierkegaard as inherently demonic and captured in the spirit of music. If Christianity, Islam, and Judaism grudgingly acknowledge that erotic pleasure has a God-given role, it may only play that role within strict sacramental confines. Venerating sensual pleasure for its own sake is lechery, and lechery is mortal sin, meaning a sin which can kill the soul. Is that not what we are told Don Juan has abandoned? His soul. Faust and Don Juan worship the body, defy time, despise or ignore the soul. The dilemma of damnation and freedom is heightened in Mozart's Italian opera. The libretto was written by Lorenzo di Ponte, a Jewish cobbler's son, who was taken under the protection of an Italian bishop and given an Italian name at baptism and was given a Catholic education. De Ponte became an ardent adherent of the teachings of Rousseau and his writing is full of Republican fervor. Ironically, the collapse of the aristo aristocratic society invade against, he invaded against cost him his living. After the French Revolution, he was reduced to poverty since there were no more despised aristocrats to commission him. A point made in Nestor Webster's French Revolution, by the way, that a lot of uh, young radicals <laughs> and a lot of people lost their jobs because the aristocracy provided so much work. Mm. For Jean Chandinet, owner of the Pardes Publishing Group, which oversaw the translation and publishing of French translations of Julius Evola, Don Giovanni is a sort of primal capitalist, one obsessed with gains and numbers, supremely superficial, the bourgeois consumer who presages what René Guénon was later to famously call the reign of quantity. And Gondinet wrote, the numerical aspect of John Joannism betrays its foremost characteristic, what Camus called in the myth of Sisyphus, the ethos of quantity. Having takes precedence over being, particularities disappear in favor of numbers. Don Juan is indiscriminate. De Ponte's republicanism is expressed in the opera in the character of Leporello, Don Giovanni's Igor, his Sancho Panza. Michel Mama, the impassioned defender of Don Giovanni, well known as a member of the French New Right, argues that Don Giovanni must be worthy of envy in order to be envied. And by an extraordinary paradox, as he sees it, De Ponte created just two years before the French Revolution, a homage, despite himself, to liberty, to the free man. In that light, Mozart's Don Giovanni honors not the clamoring crowds who will soon be cheering the tumbrils, carrying the privileged and despised aristocrats to their place of execution, but is on the contrary, a backhanded homage to that very privileged group. Seen in this way, De Ponte writing on Don Giovanni is like Milton writing on Satan, who in the famous judgment of William Blake was of the devil's party without knowing it. Mama is eloquent in his defense of the doomed Don Giovanni, and I quote, on the eve of the triumph of egalitarianism and bourgeois values, Don Giovanni tragically affirms a wholly different system of values. In Don Giovanni, there is a lightness of spirit and a Dionysian omnipotence, a complete freedom of action, which the lowly and mediocre conspire to undo. It is none other than Don Giovanni who sings the superb Viva la Libertà, it is he, the magnificent lover of all women, who tastes life to the full. It is he who defies death, and a few minutes before confronting the commandatori, that's the man of stone, sings again the sublime and insolent Vivan le femine, viva il buon vino, sostega ne gloria d'umanità. Long live women and wine, the sustenance and glory of humanity. Yes, Don Giovanni is a hero in the most traditional sense of the term and the most solitary, the most pathetic, the most generous of all heroes. He is the last free man, the last pagan, the last aristocrat, not understood and despised by all the others who oppose him in the name of their derisory and bourgeois concept of honor. Pretty strong stuff that I think. Um, that might be a place I've, I've read now for about an hour. <laughs> uh, put it to people if they wish me to, uh, or wish us to continue for what would probably be um, a bit more than an hour, or should mm. I continue for another half an hour? I think we can put it to to, to people. Stood. I mean, how do yeah, we... yeah, you, you, I, it, it does seem to be an hour, but it really has uh, 
uh, passed by um, very quickly, really. It's um, yeah. W uh, uh, any any thoughts from? I'm just under halfway through. I would say, but just under halfway. Okay, so uh, Father Frank said, you know, uh, is he, enough. He 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 he's, he is in. Well, I'm I'm assuming he's 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 enjoyed the uh, repast of words we've we've. Yeah, uh, uh, home, yes. Um. Any 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 other thoughts from any uh, Ma Michael from London? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's been an I, I'm awful lot to digest right now, and I'd almost like to just uh, contemplate on it a bit more. But but I I I won't vote. I'll let mm. go by the consensus. I, I of course, if anyone wants to read what Michael has said. Um, uh, Michael, I'm sure you, you wouldn't object to forwarding the text, would yeah, you? No, not, not at all. Not so either, either either write to Michael or myself, because uh, yeah, it was it was dense, and uh, uh, I'm saying that having the benefit of having printed it out. So um, uh, yeah, I would like to see it. That's true. I'd like to be able to read it. Mm -hmm. Oh well, that yeah, that's good. I, I shall I shall send it to you. Send it to Michael. Um, so and how do people feel? I mean, I, I am relatively easy. I do appreciate some people uh, prefer it in uh, two parts. Hmm. Um, a lot of people not expressing a definite view, though. Don't be shy. I mean, uh, but uh, don't have strong views and don't say anything. I think I've got... how, how do you feel? How do you feel, Michael? Do you do you want to go on, or would you? I'm happy either way. I'm I'm really happy either way. Hmm. Um, quite honestly. I, I'd be happy. I think I'd be happy if we stop now because, it, as somebody said, it's quite a lot to take in. Yeah. And, uh, I'd also mm. appreciate being able to to uh, read the text. Um, yeah, I mean that that is a good a good point, Robin. That, that sounds point. like a fair point. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, in that case, um, I'll take it as I say. That's a little bit under halfway, I think. Oh. Uh, well. I, I've sent. Uh, I, um, I think I've got your email address, Robin, and I have yours, Michael. So I should send. Yeah, I've the... got everybody who's a member of Soteria and, and to be a member. I have to stress this: it costs nothing. <laughs> but mm. the only thing I hope that we got in common was fake Facebook, and uh, all it means is that you you made the effort mm. just to send me an email. Then I put you on the list, and then you, you mm. know, if there's a request for text, I'd be quite happy to send them out to everybody on the I list. Think, I think we all also. Pre uh, to express our gratitude to Michael. He's put in an awful lot of work. Oh, yes. Thanks for that. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. It's been number four. I, I dread to think how much... Uh, how many <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not counting the hours, actually, Robin. I don't, I, it's <laughs> yeah, better not to. You know, I, re I realise it's all in his brain. All he has to do is to write it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh... Even so, it's... Uh... Uh, translations, you know, I just... Uh, yeah, they just streamed out of me. I didn't have to think twice about it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. I, I mean, Michael, may, may, maybe because this sort of thing is absolutely uh, cost-free, just perhaps uh, send uh, 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 the text to all, all members, maybe. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, it's just yeah, yeah, yeah. one of the beauties of the internet. It doesn't make yeah. any difference. Absolutely, it's not it's, like the old days when you had to put in an envelope and spend which money. Which was, which was, which is extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Stamp. Yeah. Remember those days. Fun. Well, uh, yeah. in that case, perhaps people would like to um, I don't know about asking questions, making comments, uh, or what they thought of that, or whatever. Yeah. Um, I mean, for, for the Frank, do you, do, you, do you have any sort of theological? Comments. I don't know because we have touched on sort of Christian orthodoxy quite a bit. Yes. Um, sorry, can you hear my voice again? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, um, towards the beginning, uh, Michael mentioned um, concepts uh, um, like how, um, you know, the idea of the devil fits into uh, Christian theology. Now, uh, the first thought which occurred to me was, of course, in the book of Job, uh, Satan, Satan, if Satan, what extent Satan is the devil, uh, or whether there are different figures, uh, deep question, but assuming that Satan, the tempter, uh, in, in the book of Job uh, is the same as the devil, or uh, a forerunner, a prototype, then uh, he, does, he, he does a job. He's just a prosecuting counsel in the heavenly court. He is not an anti-God, or he's just doing God's work, you know, he's allowed to do God's work. 
So in a way, there is no, I mean, I, I think um, it was Leibniz who said in any monotheistic religion, uh, evil uh, has to be part of God because otherwise you fall into Persian dualism. Otherwise you have two principles, light and darkness uh, who are warring uh, at war against each other. And then you have a problem where the two principles come from. Whereas um, actually another sort of important thinker who mentioned this was Gershom Scholem, uh, a great expert on the Kabbalah, uh, Jewish mysticism, who pointed out uh, that again, in monotheism, uh, evil has to be part of God. So what I'm leading up to is um, that, um, you know, that would be a, a standard Christian position. We have another comment I wanted to make, uh, because um, I think uh, Ma Michael mentioned that the devil is never redeemed. Um, the devil is damned forever. Of course, uh, there is a tradition in Oregon, um, a Christian theologian who is actually to some extent considered heretical, uh, he put forward the idea of at the end of um, there is a, at the end of a cycle with a palingenesis, a transformation of a world. And that includes something called in Greek apocatastasis, apocatastasis, which is a, an ultimate redemption. And the devil is redeemed too. So in the sense of the devil also gets uh, uh, a is dragged out of his abyss of evil. Now, that is a minority view, but it's actually quite interesting, I think. So what I want to say, again, summing it up, um, I think uh, that uh, uh, there is no problem about fitting uh, the idea of a devil into Christian theology. Yeah, you mean it's, yeah, if one uh, assumes the basis of uh, a monotheistic uh, view, it has a, has a function, yes. I suppose it, it, it's, it's like pain, really, which is uh, uh, one of those things that is nature's way of steering us towards the right course, really. Uh, although we don't like it, it um, to actually avoid pain often has good good fruit, fruits because it, it, it makes us understand reality better. We wouldn't know anything about medicine or the human body if it were not for the discomfort of disease. Uh, and similarly with, with so many other fields of uh, knowledge, I think. Um, I, I, um, I, 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 I'm not a, a, a monotheist I, I, and therefore wouldn't have any problems about reality consisting of positive and negative forces really uh, being in, in contention really I, I wouldn't have it like, like, like a like a football match but uh, um. so, I mean um, fine I understand your position um, and actually um, Leibniz uh, who's um, uh, the ODC explanation of a problem of evil from a point of view of the providence of goodness of God mm. is at times uh, although I like it at times a little bit too optimistic and people, especially people who get very um, sentimental, emotional about this, mm -hmm. ah, how can you justify, uh, you know, uh, babies born blind? How yeah. can you justify yeah. all sorts of crimes? And uh, people blow the top for this. Um, I think um, maybe in Leibniz, there is uh, optimism sometimes gets mm -hmm. a little bit too emphasized. But, uh, rationally speaking, I, I agree with it. Um, from a point of view of, of faith, again, I have no problem. But again, coming back to the point, um, um, instead, uh, if, if, yeah, I, I mean, after all, the dualism was the religion of ancient Persia. But uh, but then you have to explain where do the principle, the two principles come from? Why do we have to explain what what where they come from? <laughs> uh, we can well, just accept them as being intrinsic, but uh, I don't. <laughs> Uh, uh, my, my, Michael from London, I'm sure you've got uh, you've got something to say about this. All right, I, I'm re recalling this debate that Stephen Fry had with a group of including including Anna Whittacombe, and I guess he was asked, "What would you?" If you got to heaven, what would you say to God? And Stephen Fry's answer was, I would say, I would ask, I said, how dare you? How dare you create cancer for little children? And then he went on with a whole litany. I mean, it, it's something to think about. And so it goes back to what Michael was uh, raising earlier. What is the point of evil? Uh, what is evil good for? 
uh, I've always understood, supposedly, although I don't really understand it, within the Christian tradition, apparently, it's what allows us to have free will. Because if there were no evil, then we'd have no real choice. So uh, whether we have free will with evil or without evil, that's, I suppose, what the question comes down to. I, 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 think, I think people that do suffer uh, losses, particularly from d d disease and uh, the, 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 uh, where it affects children, uh, yeah, they can really have great difficulties uh, maintaining any instinctive faith that, that, that they, they might have. But I, I think it does help to try and have a, a long view about the universe as a, as a system whereby very simple rules exist and they seem not ever to be broken and the whole structure is miraculously created on uh, what it seems to be quite a simple basis and there is a certain beauty in that and one, one must believe uh, in the long-term um, flowering and uh, uh, good destination even though you know things along the way will uh, seem le le less pleasant than they could be. The, the the conditions that have given rise to life have also given rise to cancer. Uh, Krista, yeah, please. Oh, thank you, Sid. Um, just what you said and also what Father Frank said, um, everything is part of the godliness. If you look at the statement that was made in the um, Kabbalah, uh, I think it's Lurianic Kabbalah, they talk about the Tzimtzum, and that is where God, in fact, contracts its essence or its light, meaning, therefore, by contracting its essence or light, creating a space of denseness, a space of darkness. And in that space of darkness, God's presence is still felt, is still there, however, however not at the brilliance that it could be. Um, so therefore, where we live now and where we feel um, the devil's, uh, you know, feeling, uh, we therefore have our own evil inclination because we live in this dense world. But we can, with our evil inclination, we can in fact say, this is my evil inclination, this is my free will, but I can touch that other world, you know? I can touch God even when I'm in this dense space. Um, so in fact, it is what Father Frank said, very true. We mm. live with God and our evil inclination all in one. Um, and to, to write a poem about that is in fact probably the only thing that we can do to live with this. <laughs> and that's certainly my feeling about that. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. That's a good, good contribution. Michael from uh, Cologne, has, has the, the examination of these um, sort of theological questions in situ in, in the dramas and narratives, has it sort of helped you uh, at all sort of see any structure and or, or or truth in in the matter you know in in, in this. Uh, i i would like to say and i think you're hoping <laughs> that i will say that it has whereas i shall be honest and say that it hasn't well may, maybe that's uh, the truth it's helped you recognize the fact that actually <laughs> uh any simplistic view of things is maybe something one, one should be very suspicious of yes i, I think it's both it simply gives um, mm. a heightened awareness of the entire subject which mm. is something that in day-to-day -day life i mm. do not consciously think about so much whereas having to do this has concentrated my mind or focused my mind on 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 the subject and in that sense certainly it's increased a sort of heightened awareness but it hasn't uh regrettably brought more clarity um I, at one point what do you think about about evil good and evil which is also has to be considered and makes it i think even more complex is that the, how although religions wish to objectify it and make it you know there's an objective evil and good i think it's one of the problems of religions that in nature there is an evil for one thing that is good for another 
if we take even illnesses, I mean, if it's a bacterium, mm. for example, the point of view of bacteria, now I know a bacterium doesn't think, of course, doesn't, bacteriums don't have sort of meetings and decide what would be good for them. But in the, in the way that they behave, they are acting in their own interests. Mm. And from the point of view of the bacteria, I mean, something uh, dreadful like meningitis, which is used in, um, as, as an agent of, of the devil in Thomas Mann's Dr. Faustus, where the only person who Andrea and Leverkusen can love, it's really appalling as a small child who is, is destroyed. It's, it's, it's completely horrific. Oh, this is one of the most strongly uh, inspired books in terms of evil. But from the point of view of bacteria, um, it's not evil, is it? Um, mm. You can produce Tyrannosaurus rex and say Tyrannosaurus rex looks evil, but it looks evil to us because we would be a meal and it's frightening and those sharp teeth will cut us up. But from the point of Tyrannosaurus Rex, what does it mean mm. to be evil? What does it mean for a cancer mm. to be evil? It's acting in its own will to power. Mm. And in that sense, mm. I, I'm not uh, completely convinced. I'm not in many ways don't approve or, or, or like Nietzsche. But in other ways, in some respects, I do. And in that mm. respect, I find very hard to disagree with this idea that nature is made up of the will to power of, of mm. everything you do. I mean, even you can be the most pacific person most flower power hippie in the world yet your body still has a very topical subject at the moment of course your body has these antibodies which leap on with extreme aggression these killer cells or whatever they are leap on to any infection and destroy it you know they're very military they're not pacifistic mm -hmm. and if they weren't there the, every flower power loving hippie would immediately die Mm. as simple as that the, so within nature down to the smallest detail there is this constant struggle and fighting and there's this element as well good and evil mm. so some aren't giving any answers i'm just pointing that out mm. it's another aspect the, the the central metaphor for life i think is that of the battlefield and one of the noblest uh and most profound uh, religious texts i think we have is the bhagavad gita which is as, as I'm sure everyone knows, uh, advice given to, by Lord Krishna to Arjun on the battlefield, and it's reducible to one word, fight. Hmm. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I, I, I don't think, uh, you know, uh, both armies aren't evil, they're, they're, they just have their interests, and uh, maybe the, the, what, the one which should win will be the one that does, I don't know. But, uh, well, Krishna says to Arjuna, you have to fight because that is your job. You mm. are a Shastra, you are a fighter, you, you know, that is your job. And mm. this is why everybody, as we all are different, we have our own jobs to do in this world. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. That, that's his dharma to, to uh, mm -hmm. fight. But uh, I, yeah, uh, I mean... I would, uh, yeah, I would uh, start, though, put in a note of warning, having just said what I've said and you taking it up that I think there is a danger that people who might be inclined to what I've just almost implied doesn't exist, but does exist, which is evil, very much like to say, very much like to stress, you know, life is a fight, life is a battle, it's dog eat dog, you know, the flesh, because it's in a sense their interest to do so. Um, so I think there's that aspect, and that's the last point, mm. which I would throw in, um, is that I think that I would identify evil as, as maybe I mentioned it before, I can't remember where, as a lack of respect. And I think that's the uh, better definition of evil than anything else. Mm. Um, when you, and I think more and more people are aware of that. It's not, a hunter is considerably less evil, if that's the right word to use, than, than somebody organizing a slaughterhouse, to put it in a very banal, yeah, perhaps a rather yeah. silly way. But mm. this lack of respect for life, which, um, it, it annoys me every time I see it. I see these goons opposite my house mowing the wildflowers just as they appear. Um, it, it's not if, if they actually enjoyed cutting wildflowers because they hated them. That would be, in my opinion, less in inverted commas evil than this complete banal, complete destructive indifference, mm -hmm. which is actually something worse. Um, mm -hmm. Which is why I find actually in Lenau's Mephistopheles is, is extremely evil. He does succeed in producing very evil because this sort of indifference this banality mm. this year where maybe you might as well hang yourself anyway was, mm. You know. mm. anyway so i'm talking too much perhaps yeah, did you think lenal was was unbalanced and and that comes out in the writing or not or do you think he wrote what he wrote when he was sane and able to 
perceive a certain truth. Uh, he mentions insanity in, in Faust. Uh, he, something is insanity. And I, I, yeah. I think there is a certain lack of balance there, um, which you can also see in, very definitely in Nietzsche's writings, quite, in my opinion, quite early mm. on. There's something, mm. whoa, easy here, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that it doesn't surprise me or it didn't surprise me to learn that he had become insane, actually. Mm. Not that mm. his writings are, 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 are crazy or anything like that, but they're, they're, you know, to imagine all that and Mephistopheles say, yeah, well, hang on, this, this person's got problems, you know. Mm. Um, but mm. it comes back to the other thing again, but she, Thomas Mann, that Thomas Mann said that the sickness and genius and the ability mm. to understand mm. evil all go together, which is a very disturbing Hypothesis. Well, my ask was um, Lena also a victim to that most pervasive um, uh, condition uh, uh, which affected Nietzsche amongst many others? Well, it's Van Gogh? supposed to have uh, affected Nietzsche, and that's disputed. Oh, right. You're, oh. you're referring to syphilis. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah no, I mean, that, it's very disputed. There was a long article in the Telegraph about 20 years ago. Um, it suggested that it was perhaps uh, allied propaganda that had really pushed this legend because oh, really? the idea that Germans leading philosopher who'd been so uh, melodramatically admired by Germany's dictator mm. that uh, it, it fitted in very well so yeah well he was mad just as you know Hitler's mad and, mm. and, and the philosopher he loved was also completely cuckoo mm. and uh, suffered from syphilis I mean that, that, that of course is is not good publicity but, I mean, so it, it's disputed sorry. to this day so and i'm not a, a a medical expert but there are medical experts i i don't think yeah. medical expert is necessarily a compliment from what i've seen these days but a point about insanity um oh, in the light of some modern um, um psychoanalytical and psychological theories for example i'm thinking of rd lang the well-known scottish um psychiatrist who wrote a beautiful book when he by himself. Mental illness is, um, I mean, mental illness very often indicates a, a new personality which is struggling to emerge from the bonds or convention or social pressure, parental pressure and so on. Now, um, I don't know, I mean, this is a bit of a wild thing, uh, I guess, but I, mean, I don't know what extent of that would apply to people like uh, Lena or Nietzsche. But I'm just, you know, sometimes I'm a bit worried about this sharp dichotomy between uh, normality, whatever it is, and, and, and insanity. I think, uh, uh, I mean, uh, some great thinkers have uh, manifested uh, uh, elements or what people who regard as megalomania, insanity. Schopenhauer thought some of his uh, passages in uh, in his book uh, Die Welt aus Willen Vorstellung were actually dictated by the Holy Ghost. Now um, you say, well, he was uh, what was he uh, the sign of insanity? I don't know, but. <laughs> Um, yeah. I, 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 yeah, like that's really interesting. But I'd like to throw in a, 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 I, I don't know which book it was, but I, I'm quite an admirer of Agatha Christie's. And in one of her books, uh, uh, one of the characters uh, says, oh, the person who's committing this, these two murders must be completely insane, completely mad. And Miss Marble says, no, dear, no, dear, terribly sane. The maddest people are the sane ones. And I've never for, forgotten that. It really got me sort of thinking, and I, it's very, very true, that mm, if you're completely sane, you, 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 you're you mm. probably madder than anybody else. Everything follows. It's, once you take one precedent, you follow that in complete determined logic. Mm. That can be the worst kind of madness. Whereas normal people are probably a little bit, as you say, it's a little bit blurred, which is... Mm. K good. Catherine, is, is, is that hand raised to contribute? Or... No, sorry. No, no, I was just oh. trying to stretch it. So Sorry. I'll just sort of pull you in. Uh, yeah, if, there's a special oh, function here. You can put yeah. your hand up. Uh, Stefan, I think that was a hand raised to continue. Yes. Uh, I think uh, normality, uh, if, if, if we take normality as a standard of uh, health and uh, mental health, uh, then I, I, I do not wish to be normal. <laughs> I agree, yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I, 
Is you it, wish it, to elaborate on that, or is that just, or, or maybe, <laughs> maybe, or perhaps not? not perhaps not. Okay. Uh, I, I just, just returning to the uh, a matter we touched on briefly. It seems to me that syphilis is a really. Uh, oh, sorry, visit. said I didn't answer your oh. question, and the answer is I don't know. <laughs> So it, there was a question that we got lost, and the answer is I don't know. Don't, Sorry, I it seems to me a, a vivid representation of this Faustian temptation, really, the the um, uh, promise of pleasure, but one is losing one's sanity down the road if one enjoys it. And that possibly would have been how it presented itself in the time before there was any cure. Well, this is exactly the thesis in mm. Thomas Mann's Dr. Faust, yeah. whereas the, the uh. beautiful prostitute Heteria Esmeralda is sent by the devil as the butterfly mm. goddess of love who has the little, as he calls his little minions, mm. who, who eat into Adrian Leverkusen and eventually destroy him. Mm. I don't know if um, Michael, as a Germanist, know of a very bizarre play by a German writer called Oskar Panzer called Council Love, which was it. written, it, it, it starts in, in heaven. And there is a, a dialogue between uh, the Trinity and angel, and God uh, decides, uh, so looks down on humanity, which is supposed to be set at the time of the Renaissance, and sees so much depravity, he decides to send down syphilis in the shape of a beautiful courtesan to go infect the whole of humanity. Uh -huh. it. Now, that play actually uh, cost the Panis imprisonment in Catholic Bavaria uh, over a you know, century ago in Catholic mm -hmm. Bavaria. It was staged in Rome once in a little <laughs> almost clandestine place. I, mean, I went to see it. It wasn't very good. But the play is a great idea. And again, it goes back to theology, mm -hmm. but he brings the punisher right back to God. He sends down syphilis in the shape of... And actually the words say, go down, go to the Pope, go to the Cardinal, go to the bishops, go to the priests, and infect them all, give them all the pox. Uh, there was at least one Pope, and try to remember, I think Leo X, who might have died of syphilis. It's possible, yes. But why, I was slightly intrigued, why would he be in prison? I, I, I would have imagined... That oh, he blasphemy, blasphemy. Well, in Catholic Bavaria, uh, writing about kind of play is blasphemy. Well, I suppose if the God said that very directly, but it was very often interpreted, I should have thought, in the conservative, I mean, very often seen as, as a punishment. It's very in your face, the play. You can Google it and find okay, it. Okay, yeah. Oscar mm -hmm. Panisson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think... Uh, hmm. uh, 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 Edith, do you have any any anything? It's nice to have some words from people that uh, I have to get uh, washing it's just pouring sorry it's what so it's sorry what was that Catherine you're I have to go and get the washing <laughs> oh right you have to go yeah you I was just going to say that um I watch I found an English language version of the opera that Michael uh, told us about by Boito called Mephistophele. Oh, right. yes, yes. Um, yeah. By Pacific Northwest Opera. Ah, uh, must right. be in, the north, in Oregon or something, do you think? Anyway, it's on YouTube. Right. It's totally excellent. But um, it, what really caught my attention was that Boito, who also wrote the libretto, I think, yeah. is mm. one of the few people who's dwelt on who's drawn attention to the paradisian sort of bliss that the Faust characters are losing, i.e. to what we're losing when we go down this road. Because yeah, nobody yeah. else really dwells on, so it's hard to feel mm, mm. the loss because they don't describe mm. the uh -huh. gorgeous beauty of the natural, uh, untouched, innocent world. And, mm, and in fact, mm. in um, it, and then there's this glorious aria about 15 minutes into the opera, um, and um, he's uh, Faust is coming back from a, a lovely walk in the country, 
that she and he, they, he was chatting to a friend, Wagner. I think it's something, yeah, I it's Wagner. Remember. It's always Wagner in this house. Uh, but the tune, and, and w when you played it in Italian, I thought, my God, but I could sort of understand what, what he was describing. He was describing the bliss that he was about to throw away. And actually, wherever this was performed in the Pacific Northwest, at that point, the audience stood up and applauded as he ended the aria. So it completely blew them away in English because mm. because the words are describing the one thing we want to know is what is Faust throwing away? What yeah, is yeah. we throwing away when we choose progress, the delights, you know, the washing machine, the you know, all the things that come and, and all the, you know, when we choose that, what are we throwing away? And I feel that very few of the writers actually dwell long enough on what Faust is throwing away for us to appreciate. They're all a bit focused on, well, I don't know. Anyway, that's just was my, my mm. thought. I think that's an extremely valid point. Actually. Yeah, actually, yeah. The one you just, um, the one, the yeah. one you tra just translated, the, uh, I've forgotten his name now, beginning yeah, no. with L. Lenar. Yeah, yeah Lenar. He does spend a bit of time describing um, the beauty of nature and spring and whatever. He does, and I, I, he wrote an, a lot. I've got a very fat book there. I'm slightly, as I say, put off by the quality of the book. It's got rather it's low quality paper. It's a bit smudged. And, but um, I'm not qualified to say if he writes in a positive way about a lot of things. Um, but I think your point is extremely valid. Uh, uh, this Faustian legend, perhaps though in the nature of it, it's it's concentrates on this uh, sort of on this damnation, on this loss, and even the optimistic Faust of Goethe doesn't, in my opinion, seem to portray portray that very positive positive view. Yeah. We don't, we've, already, we've already lost it. There's very few people left around by the Industrial Revolution. Who actually? I don't. Who actually? I can't. You know. Um, who really have that sense of what what we've thrown away? Um, it's the joy of the spirit. That's presumably the joy of the virtuous spirit, uh, which is is the thing that he's throwing away. The pleasures of the soul, really, rather than pleasures of the body. So I don't think that necessarily is linked to pre-industrialized. Like he just someone that has a, a soul that's got um, uh, a degree of in integrity and hasn't uh, been, been, been sold to, um, you know, the, the, uh, the to, to ends that are not worthy of it. Um, yes, but... No, I understand. I, I take, uh, I don't quite, I'm not sure about that. Uh, there, there is a repeated mention in the Faust legend of the joys of nature and, and, and uh, spring. Mm. And I mean, um, in, in Goethe's Faust, there is that he's, he's, he, he steps back, he balks at taking, at taking his own mm. life because at uh, Easter, everybody's singing of the joys mm. of prison, Christ has arisen, and the, but it's more the joys of spring, in fact. And I think there is a lot in the uh, Faust legend about the joys of, of, of nature and the natural countryside. Mm. And well, the, it's easier to write about than the joys of the soul, isn't it, I suppose? But... Uh... Um, that's why uh, I'm interested in paganism, you see, because, and why we all are maybe, because it seems that there was more, there's more connection in those ancient yeah. times with, um, you know, I mean, nature was brutal, of course, brutal, but it, it wasn't as awful as a, a huge sort of nuclear power station or, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, did, Catherine, did you want to jump in? I, Oh, was you... Sorry, so I was just trying to get the rain out of my hair. <laughs> <laughs> you're teasing us, you're teasing us. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, sorry, you did that. Well, I think um, this discussion has, has been the benefit that we've had by shortening yeah, it, yes, the talk, frankly, it, because everyone is, has yes. got more energy. To, to do that. So I, I, I think that proves the decision to have been a sound one. Um, I think I think Michael has just... He's just said he's been thrown out by his machine, he thinks. Oh, OK. He was able to say that before he was thrown out. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, m m maybe we, uh, Michael, perhaps we, we should sort of tie threads together and... Uh, uh, well, so. well, if I understand it correctly, then uh, the, the, the desire would be that the, the 
I'm losing count now. At the fifth part, <laughs> will will we'll be next month. Yeah, I think that's, that is a wise thing to say because okay, that'll that 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 will give get that that will give Edith a bit longer to 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 do her thing and uh, other people. Right. As well, well, so we so. could let people know, couldn't we? Now, I mean, that would then be the thirteenth of June. Because yeah. that was okay. what we penciled in for you. Yeah, thirteenth of June. I mean, don't worry, I'll, I'll send a note. Obviously, I'll yeah. send a written, uh, as you've hopefully noticed. I send quite a few emails telling you when it happens. But uh, for anybody who's who's hanging in here still, it'd be the thirteenth of of June at the same time. I mm. say, don't see any times. All right, I think. Yeah, I think it's a good time. A good time. Uh, oh yeah, oh, we've fine. we've we've lost Robin, haven't we? Yeah. Oh, well. um, Okay, and to, to let you know the delights, we will have some readings from Thomas Mann and some uh, play of a short excerpt from Don Giovanni. Yeah, I, oh, that'd be great. With, that'd be with, sorry, Stefan. Which Thomas Mann, uh, be, before or after 21 or 22? Because I, in, in my conscience, there are two. Thomas Mann. Yeah, yes, I know. Well, it, it, it is relating, obviously, to the Faustus legend. So it would be your Thomas Mann part two, definitely, mm -hmm. in that sense. Uh, yeah, I know he he changed his uh, certainly his political views quite quite dramatically. Totally, totally. Uh, um, I would not agree with totally is a strong word, but that is something perhaps we can discuss next time after mm -hmm. the reading from the Thomas Mann. But yeah, obviously, uh, from his book Doctor Faustus, as this is about the Faustus. Legend. I think that was an early on. I do not remember. No, 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 I might, no, it wasn't. Uh, he wrote it in 1943. Oh, uh, in, okay. in, in exile. And I think it was published first in uh, Switzerland in 1947. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I, but just before, well, before we go, could I draw people's attention to the moot on Wednesday with Dr. Prudence Jones talking about uh, constellations um, from the uh, point of view of northern myth that will be eight o'clock for eight fifteen a bit a bit later uh and there'll be a bloat to lord frey uh, the the god of, of wealth and uh um material uh, comforts and um peace uh that that will be the, uh, at noon uh next 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 sunday for those interested in attending uh, is that next sunday or the 30th ne uh, uh yeah it's it's next yes, sunday which is the 30th you, you mean the 30th don't you oh, yeah sorry. It, yeah it is oh, the 30th. sorry sorry <laughs> it's, that's not I next sunday confused. next sunday is the 23rd thank you so much oh is it um yes it is oh really yes, look i thought i was bad at getting no it's the, the next 27th. sunday is the 23rd you mean the 30th I'm oh, you're absolutely right. I, I I thought I've excelled myself in, in in having finished the liturgy a week early, but I've done even better. I've done it a fortnight early. <laughs> Dear me! I mean, I, I'm. I can go back to bed for now. You yeah. Faster than for others. You know. <laughs> That's yeah. wonderful. Okay. That's yeah. wonderful. I'll be at the blow. Thank you very much. Excellent. So, yeah, and by the Lovely. way, if anybody's interested in those things, uh, they should write to Stead about yeah. them. But it's the same link. So, I, th uh, I think most most people, people are well, on the maybe same way. Well, maybe one or two are not. I don't know. But, uh, no, yeah, we yeah. are. <laughs> Is that also a virtual meeting or a fiscal one? Uh, both, both uh, via Zoom, via this link, via this link, Stefan. So you'd be very welcome to come along, of course, to anything. Uh, I'd be interested if. Uh... I th I think you should. I think you're on the mailing list. You should. I I'll check. You should have got the link. Uh, but it, it's the thirtieth for the bloat, and Wednesday the nineteenth for the the moot with Prudence Jones, who she wrote a history. Uh, I think it's a standard history with Nigel Pennick about pagan Europe, and she's a a well versed lady. So that 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 that, that should be interesting. Should be interesting. Uh, I would say that both Stead and I are quite good at at sending mails, reminding people. And I I know one or two other groups who do webinars, and they send one mail inviting you, something like a week before. And I think we can say, Stead and I, that we don't do that. You get a, a month's notice and then another mail mm. and then another yeah, mail. Thank I you. think I sent four, if not mm. five, for this. And Stead does exactly the same. So if you're on our, either list, you'll certainly get lots of mails. It helps. Thank you. It does. Uh, people <laughs> miss mails. I mean, I, I do myself or whatever, yeah. you know, mm. uh, it can easily happen. So if, But if you mm. get four or five mails, you should see one of them. 
Exactly. All right. So should we? Uh, I'll stop the recording now. I think so. Thanks, um, everyone, very much for for, for coming and for yeah. contributing with and uh, uh, Stefan in particular. You know, thanks so much coming along because this uh, uh, English is not your first language, so this can't be easy. And I, you know, it, it's very good of you to to, to I think you say the same much. for Daniel. It's not his first. Yes, language. indeed. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So let's stop recording. Yeah, stop recording.